you get to a certain age, some of you may know, where people say, oh, he's had a fall instead of, oh, he fell over. And uh, I insist that I fell over. I didn't ever fall. So I should say at the start that when Bill and I discussed the possibility of doing a discussion like this, it was at a time when, in fact, a possibility of peace talks looked rather more promising about five or six weeks ago. I have to say that is not so much the case now, but I want to stick to the title, which seems to be an absolutely legitimate title to look at, um, but put it in a wider context, because if you're trying to work out whether there's any prospects for peace talks in the near term, then one has to know where the different groups are coming from and what the chances are of any sort of beginnings of a compromise. So I will go back over the sort of slightly broader history, but with that view in aim, working at how the world is seen from the different participants, primarily um, NATO, Russia, and of course, Ukraine. Uh, there are other factors as well, China, India, and the rest, but I think those three are the main ones. So if you don't mind, I'll sort of go back more or less to the beginning and just look at how this war developed, where it came from, uh, and why, at least from a Russian perspective, it has gone very seriously wrong. And the signs are now that there's not an immediate prospect for peace talks that may change in the spring, or we can talk about what might happen uh, and how it might happen. Uh, but for the moment, it's more a case of trying to get a feel for where the different sides are coming from. The problem is that it's really complex. If you, and Isabel, you used the term complexity at the start, uh, because there are so many different actors and attitudes playing, not least in Russia itself, but also in NATO as well. And it's trying to make some sense of those if we're going to have any chance of predicting how things might develop. And also taking a lead from the experience of when wars do end. I should say at the start, I'm not a Ukraine specialist. If you work in the field of international relations or international security, um, people often say, well, are you a country specialist in somewhere? In other words, do you concentrate on one country or region? I don't really, perhaps the Middle East to some extent, but it's more a concern with how wars start and how they may be prevented in the first place and how they might be brought to an end. And I have to say on that latter part, I have colleagues at Bradford who are far more expert at that, have been involved in mediation. In fact, the founding uh, professor of peace studies, Avon Curl, was a Quaker and well known for mediating in some of the world's most difficult conflicts at the end of the Biafra War and one of the end of Pakistan Wars, and of course in Northern Ireland and the Middle East. So I really, I take that from other people that I've, I've learned from, particularly at Bradford. Um, I think it's probably best, I know this is going to be a reminder for many, if not most of you, and I should also say that anything one says about this area is likely to be contested. I have no problem with that, but obviously any kinds of questions that people want to raise, I'll try and deal with them, or we may try and deal with them as a group. I'll be guided by Isabel on that. But the point is, everywhere there is contestation, and I think we have to accept that. Having said that, I'll start by trying to look at it from the Russian point of view, but then feed in how NATO is behaving in the 1990s and early 2000s. As far as Russia was concerned, I think uh, for the Russian people, I should say one other thing, we do have family connections, both from Russia and, and slightly less directly from Ukraine. Um, so I have quite good links with how people in Russia, in, in our case, people are very bitterly um, contesting uh, Putin and what he stands for. But I have some knowledge of that, but it's just probably most people are in that position now anyway. Um, if we go back to 1990, it is worth remembering that the breakup of the Soviet Union was incredibly rapid. It was essentially more or less all over in about 40, 50 weeks in 1989, 1990. Uh, now, that is an extraordinary position because although one always talks about the Soviet Union, the reality was that it was primarily a Russian-led entity. Yes, the Russians only made up maybe um, barely half of the total population, and that was in what we call Russia now, but essentially it was very much focused on Russia and focused on Moscow. I do remember spending some time in Moscow in the 1980s, and one of the common phrases then was the importance of maintaining the Russian near abroad. And that made, made, really meant the peripheral countries immediately closest to Russia, because even in the late 1980s, I remember in 1988, 
when Gorbachev was just starting, starting to have his impact and you could see the possibility of radical political change, then the fear was that uh, basically the heartland, if you like, of Russia would be exposed to threats from outside. And the concern was not with China, the concern was with uh, NATO. And that I think really has to be borne in mind because when Russia did uh, separate out through the Conference of Independent States, uh, you actually had a kind of pseudo commonwealth, but very rapidly the takeoff of a particular kind of market fundamentalism, or if you like, a neoliberalism. And this was the period between about 1991 and more or less the end of the decade under most of the Yeltsin years, where it was the era of turbo capitalism or hyper capitalism. And this was when you had huge um, changes in wealth distribution with relatively few people in the probably fairly low thousands, particularly maybe low tens of thousands, who were able to take over much of the wealth of the country with a few kleptocratic oligarchs who were really to the fore. And it meant that Russia as a whole went through an extreme political um, and economic problem. It really did. I mean, at one time, it was reckoned that a third of all Russians were below the poverty line. And the problem of alcoholism among particularly men over the age of 40 was extreme, so much so that the life expectancy of men fell by a number of years in that period. By the end of the 1990s and the coming to power of Putin, right at the end of that decade, you had the beginnings of a change and Putin coming very much from a KGB background, uh, knowing in some ways how to manipulate a use, a use force, he began to bring a degree of order, although that had happened to some extent towards the end of the Yeltsin years. But in the early part, <coughs> excuse me, of the, uh, of the current uh, century, you actually have the changeover to Putin, who has now been in power for 22 years. Um, a very early move by Putin and the people around him was to get control of basically the, the criminal warlords and the real um, oligarchs. And that was done fairly quickly by making a pretty tough example of two or three of them. And that meant that certainly by about 2003, four and five, Russia was beginning to get more money in itself at the governmental level. Oil prices were rising, of course, and that meant that things began to change and economic growth started quite seriously. Almost from the start, Putin put a lot of effort into rebuilding the military which was almost moribund by the end of the 1990s. Much of the concentration of that was, <coughs> pardon me, in some new machinery, new weaponry, but also particularly on the nuclear side as well. So that by 2004 or five, uh, Russia is becoming quite a serious military power and was always a major nuclear power because of retaining all its nuclear stockpiles, particularly at the strategic level. Now, from really about nine, two, from 2001 through to 2005, you began to see the development of Putin's own line of thinking. And it's difficult to say whether this was Putin himself or really extracting thinking <coughs> from what was going on behind the scenes. Sorry, I've got a slight cold, so I may need to take sips occasionally. So just bear with me, I can do 10 to. It's just, it's worth going through one other, other aspect of Russian history. <clears throat> and that is right back in the 1920s, there was thinking within Russia, which is about the restoration of Russia as such. Of course, that was at, uh, anathema uh, to the Soviet system. One of the leading thinkers of the time, Lev Gumilev, <clears throat> spent quite a lot of time in a Soviet jail. But the view there was that in some way, Russia could and would be reborn as a sort of greater Rus with a stronger element related to the Orthodox Church, <coughs> sorry, uh, to the Orthodox Church, and also the belief that Russia in the longer term would be at the front of a new Eurasia. Not entirely clear where China fitted into this, but certainly this was a feeling, a subplot right through the Soviet years. It never really came to the fore. In fact, Gumilev died, I think, in the late 1940s. But there have been other people carrying this through. And with the end of the Soviet system in 1990, mm. it got a real new lease of life. <clears throat> and at some stage, uh, Putin latched onto this. 
The key figure in recent years, I would say, has probably been uh, Alexander, uh, Alexander Dugan, um, a sort of public intellectual. He's still only in his 60s, and he has technically a chair at Moscow State University. But he's something of a guru figure for Putin himself, and followed by a lot of Russians. So you have this sense of, bluntly, <coughs> where this, we've heard this phrase before, making Russia great again in this case. So it's not Modi, it's not um, Trump, uh, it's not Erdogan and others, it's making Russia great again. Uh, but this was a very strong sort of subline of thinking, which really is there quite strongly. And you see it in Putin's speeches, particularly in the last five or six years. Now, I'm going into this little bit of detail because I think we need to see where this change was coming from. By the late 2000s, <coughs> before 2010, Russia was starting to move out, uh, take a greater concern with uh, issues in the Middle East, in Syria, in the Sahel, in Georgia, of course, the intervention in Georgia. And finally, when you get through into the 2010s, uh, essentially Crimea. What was this about as far as Crimea is concerned? And don't forget that already Belarusia was essentially almost a client state of Moscow. The reality was that it's a question of pushing NATO back because I think there were two things which really affected Russian thinking a lot in the, in the 1990s. One was, I think to correctly use the correct word, the contempt within which Russia was held in NATO, that, you know, it was a failed alliance and we had won. And that, I think, is bitterly resented among older Russians, particularly people over 50, even now. And I think the second issue is that within that, you had the feeling uh, that basically NATO is extending itself right up to the Russian borders. And to some extent, moving back in terms of Crimea and elsewhere, was starting to push back westwards. And without going into any detail, when we came to the, uh, basically the Ukraine war, 4th, 24th of February, you know, this still this year's, not even 10 months back, then you actually had a very clear uh, special military operation, as it was called, which was really going to take things back very quickly. There was the belief, a mistaken belief, within the Russian military thinking that essentially Ukraine would be something of a walkover. And it would be possible to bring Ukraine back into the fold, as indeed um, uh, Belarus was already, and therefore have a much larger country in population terms, much more developed with a strong economy, a strong agriculture and the rest. But that would actually be a huge addition uh, to what you might call the Russian sphere of influence, the Russian near abroad. And in many ways, the combination of Ukraine and Belarus in due course, no doubt, with forward-based nuclear weapons, would push the whole central gravity two or 300 kilometers to the west of where it was before. And that would represent the start of the aim to get a, a Russian reborn. Now, that all sounds sort of pretty intense and, and maybe over the top, <clears throat> but the reality is many older Russians took and still take this view. Add to that the progress of the war itself, and you see how things began to come apart pretty quickly. <coughs> Excuse me just a minute. And it is just worth spending five minutes just explaining why almost from the start, the war did not have the intended results. What was planned initially, and we know this in fact from Putin himself now in some subsequent speeches, <coughs> was actually uh, to change the government almost from the start. And that involved an armed intervention in Kyiv itself. The capital city, only what, <coughs> 150 kilometers uh, from the, the Russian border. And that was due to take place because there would be a very early airborne landing in a very large airstrip, only 20 kilometers northwest of Kyiv, the Antonov Strip, where they made the huge Antonov transport planes. That would basically provide the forward base. Um, the Russians would put in lots of military transports while others cross the border <clears throat> in a very quick period of time, two or three days, <clears throat> maybe at the very much a week, um, Ukraine would be under um, a new government, which was um, acceptable to Moscow. And the belief was there would be very little opposition in Ukraine as a whole. In fact, in the eastern part of the country, in the southeast, people would welcome the Russian intervention. That turned out not to be the case. <clears throat> the Ukrainians themselves uh, were able to know in advance 
that this Russian move was as it seemed. And in fact, there's a brigade of special forces ready for the Russian attempt to take the airfield. It was due to take maybe three to six hours to do it. It took 36 hours of very bitter fighting. So all the business of surprise was lost. And even from the Sunday afters, remember, and this is actually a key point, on the Thursday, the 24th of February, about 4 a.m. in the morning, the war started. <clears throat> By Sunday, just three days later, Putin gave his public speech, <coughs> pardon me, his public speech in which he threatened that if NATO intervened, a disaster could unfold. And the implication was sort of some sort of nuclear retaliation. Even by that Sunday, Putin's people knew that the plot was going extremely badly wrong and that NATO, if anything, had things going to some extent its way. At the start, NATO is significant, especially the United States, in providing uh, intelligence, <coughs> almost real-time intelligence right through. But bit by bit in the months that followed, uh, Ukraine itself uh, got more and more supplies from the West, particularly from the United States, and in the early days uh, from Britain as well. If you look at the whole pattern of events, uh, initially within about a month, the Russians have been forced quite widely back in many areas. There was a regrouping. By May and June, Russia was actually making some headway. <clears throat> and that went right through until August, when the Americans decided to provide some of their very advanced systems, particularly the high Mars artillery rocket system. And then in some ways, the balance of military power uh, fell the other way. And we now see with the taken Kherson recently, uh, if anything, uh, the Ukrainians are to some extent in the ascendancy, but Russia has also held on, and it is, I'm afraid, now a very dangerous stalemate. <clears throat> I would actually use the phrase here, uh, which some people use, which I think is a good way of putting it, is that we are in a state of violent stalemate in which neither side can win and neither side can lose. And simply what I mean by that is, if, for example, um, the Russia has find itself really pushed back and NATO is providing the kind of equipment which it could do, which would allow the Ukrainians to push the Russians back over the border, that will be the time when there would be a risk <coughs> of the use of tactical nuclear weapons, or at least their threatened use. Of course, don't forget that was standard NATO policy when it seemed to be the Soviet Union that had the massive forces back in the 1980s. So this is nothing new in the way that nuclear weapons are thought of by major nuclear powers. But essentially, given that kind of situation, Russia uh, could not easily be defeated in the conventional sense. But if, and it seems very unlikely now, Russia itself <coughs> was to get uh, in a position of superiority, when it, like it seemed to do basically uh, four or five months ago, briefly, then NATO, without question, would actually provide more and more weapons that the Ukrainians needed. Because this is very much a, an extraordinary combination of a conventional state-on-state -state war and a proxy war at the same time. And in many ways, um, the, the decision on how long this war lasts rests primarily with Washington, not Kiev and not Moscow. Because R Rush Washington can really almost decide the pace of the war. If you want to talk the hardware, then an example is the high mile system with a range of what, about 70 kilometers has its value. The Americans also have an attack system, which has a range of about 250 kilometers. They've not provided that to Ukraine because that would tip the advantage very strongly on the Ukrainian side. And in the Russian, in the American view, that might make things very unstable. <clears throat> there is another view, of course, in the United States that it is better for this war to go on for a long time because in doing that, you weaken a potential future rival, Russia itself. I'll say a little about that uh, more in, in a little while. So that I think is more or less where we are at present, a violent stalemate. Two or three things which I think are worth adding on here. One is the attitudes to the Ukraine war <coughs> vary a great deal across the world. I was in a Zoom webinar this morning with uh, somebody in Accra in Ghana. And one of the people asked, well, what is the view of the war now, now where we are from Accra? And she said, well, it's not a really a very great concern to us. We've got much more worrying things to concern ourselves locally. Inflation, uh, the risk of insurgencies and coups, five coups in Western Africa uh, this year so far. And she says, that's where we are really focused. 
uh, it's it, basically it is not what is happening up in the north in Europe. Wider than that, while um, West will, the West will get many countries from the global south supporting it in UN votes, if you look at the attitude of people across the global south, it's very different. And essentially, it is much more a case of not pro-Russian, but not particularly pro-West. It's a question of a plague on both your houses. That's even more understandable, of course, across the Middle East, uh, where the kinds of carnage uh, that is being experienced in Ukraine is not at all unlike the levels of carnage and loss of life in um, Iraq, in Afghanistan, on a smaller scale in Libya, and of course in Syria. So, you know, people look at it in very different ways in different parts of the world. So that, I think, is one point. Uh, the second is that China, while normally supporting Putin, has been a lot more cautious in what it says in recent months. In one sense, if Putin was to lose badly, that would not be too disastrous for China, because China then clearly would be the great Eurasian power. <coughs> but if Putin was to win, that that would also be quite good for Russia as well, uh, for China as well. Because in a sense, if that was to happen, uh, then uh, China would sort of not link with Russia, but at its own pace. And I think in a sense, uh, the Russian thinking in this area hasn't got very far in terms of the idea you can incorporate China into sort of a greater e e Eurasia with Russia at the front. is of course a nonsense. But that still seems to be held among some people in the Moscow thinking. <clears throat> Another factor I think which you have to remember is that one of the things that we have to appreciate is that people in the Western world um, have experienced modern urban warfare in all its ferocity, loss of life, and frankly carnage and barbarism that is not uncommon and experienced elsewhere in the world. The thing is on this occasion it came to Europe and certainly in the early months, 24 seven television. That I think has made people think it's only in that kind of uh, area in modern Europe that you have this kind of carnage, not at all. And this goes back to the previous point of what's been happening in the Middle East. You look at the destruction of some of the Ukrainian cities. Well, Fallujah, um, basically Western Mosul and others were just as bad, if not worse. You look at the, the bomb data for Western Mosul, you know, the whole area is, is picked up. It was like Stalingrad made worse. And we always tend to forget that. It, the world is not quite, I think, as we see it. That is not diminishing in any way the barbarity of many of the Russian actions. But that, again, there, there are reasons why you can see that as well. But essentially, I think what I'm trying to get at is this is the kind of climate that we have here where we're trying to talk about the possibility of a peaceful settlement. Let me just check on how... Sorry, I'm going, going on a fair bit. Let me go on to the second part, really. There's plenty to discuss, but we have lots of time for questions and discussion and probably disagreements. Let's move to the possibility of whether there could be any kind of settlement. Well, on the Russian side, it is very difficult to get a clear picture of the power of different attitudes within Russia. Obviously, you have some very good reporting coming out of well, it's mostly um, the Russian independent media, which is now abroad and operating from Eastern Europe. But they are giving pretty good reports, pretty accurate reports, I'm told, of what the feeling is like within Russia itself. Broadly speaking, the older people in Russia are still pretty largely supporting Putin. And you will find that there are elements which you might almost describe as ethno-fascist who are very strong in support for him among younger Russians, many of whom, probably 700,000 now, have left the country, leaving a huge gap in know-how apart from anything else, then people are much more cautious. We do not know yet um, what is the effect of all the loss of life. Nobody knows fully how many young Russians have been killed in the armed forces. It is probably somewhere between 40 and 60,000. Now, remember that in the whole of the Afghan war, the Russian intervention, essentially over eight years from 1980 to what was in 88, you had a death toll of between 10 and 12,000. Well, you've had two or three times that already in the space of just 10 months. And that, I think, has to be sort of factored in, if you like. It was certainly the case with, and I suppose, a much more liberal leader in, in uh, Gorbachev, 
that Gorbachev's people took huge note of basically the feelings of the, 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 the childless mothers, the mothers who had lost sons in particular, inevitably, given the nature of gender in warfare in this kind of fighting. But essentially, there's no real indication of whether there's a big change in mood with that yet. We do know that obviously the Putin um, control machine is pretty strong and does believe very strongly what it's doing. But it's quite possible that things could change there really quite quickly. I think there's a fluidity which we have to take into account. On the Western side, this I think brings us to one of the trickiest questions. Um, what are the elements in the West who do not want a settlement? There's no doubt quite a few of them. I'll give you a bit of evidence of that in a moment or two. But it's clear that within Washington and to some extent within Britain and some other NATO countries, there is a case for allowing this war to continue at a low level, slowly wearing down, to use the crude phraseology, the Russian war machine. It is certainly true that sanctions are working much slower than expected. There's actually a very interesting piece in today's New York Times explaining that may be true, but they are having a long-term impact, which will be seriously damaging to the Russian economy. That won't really become apparent for two or three years, but it is there. This all means that essentially one element within the West would want the war to continue. Um, and one person I remember cynically saying right at the start of the war, NATO will fight this war against Russia to the last Ukrainian. That's a pretty grim way of looking at it, but there's an element of thinking in essentially the, the, the brittleness of strategic thinking as it exists nowadays. Where does that leave us with the possibility of any beginnings of peace? Well, it's just worth remembering that any major international conflict, bar a very few, <clears throat> does end and often ends with a degree eventually of post-conflict peace building. Isabel said some very nice things about the Peace Studies Group at Bradford, where I worked for a number of years, although not in this specific field. Many of our students ended up in what was called post-conflict peace building, uh, working in communities that have been very badly damaged, where in Afghanistan, uh, the Balkans, Northern Ireland, certainly, just helping in the process of people uh, getting the confidence to work together. And sometimes, provided the outsiders don't get too big for their boots, they can play a quite useful role. And I have to say that I, I'm not a Quaker myself, but it all power to so many Quaker groups around the countries who have actually been involved in this kind of work. Um, so there are possibilities. There are possibilities where if there's any kind of opening, um, then you build on it and try and get very informal talks going. Right throughout the Cold War, many of you will have heard of the, the Pugwash group, scientists on both sides of the so-called Iron Curtain who continued to work together. And they were very significant when the arms control negotiations really got going in the 1960s <coughs> and in the late 1980s. And so you get groups like that. Um, there are people who are trying to do that with Ukraine at present time. Um, but the issue, of course, inevitably is with all the loss of life, with all the destruction in Ukraine, is the Ukrainian government prepared to negotiate in any way when it looks like Russia is in a rather weak position? One suspects that Russia, that the Ukrainian government <coughs> is aware of the nature of this conflict and its sort of very rigid way and probably would be willing to do some negotiations, at least opening the possibility of the door. Once you get any kind of situation where there seem to be openings, then one side or the other, without admitting defeat or even in serious trouble, could put out feelers independently and basically completely unofficially. It's what's broadly called track two diplomacy, and it has different variations. And you see it sometimes working initially and then failing, as in the Oslo peace process. Uh, you see it in all kinds of ways in Northern Ireland. You know, when the British government, even under Margaret Thatcher, was saying you would never under any circumstances talk to terrorists, then behind the scenes, um, they would sort of, there would be back channels in which people could actually talk and sort of each side could deny it. Um, I remember about, about 10 years ago, yes, it would have been about, uh, about 12 years ago, about 2010, there was a period when things were really pretty tense between the United States and, uh, and Iran. And there were groups meeting. I remember one met 
uh, at a sort of small estate in Oxfordshire, which brought together some quite high-ranking Iranians and some quite high-ranking, uh, usually retired uh, American diplomats, one or two Brits as well, for informal talks of two or three days, just to look at what possibilities might be. Now, neither government would in any way admit that they were involved because they weren't officially involved. But the fact is that if you have a, a recently retired American diplomat engaging in completely informal talks with his basically Iranian opposite number, then in the evening, you know, the phone lines might be busy, one would direction through to Tehran, another to Washington. And that's the how, how things can start. As far as I know, <coughs> that is not yet in existence in any formal way. The worrying thing is that I know of one group who is in a position to do this, who's basically been lightly warned off by the British government, who say, no, we're not there yet. But they're very sort of cherry about when it quotes wet yet is. Now that doesn't mean that it can't happen. It doesn't mean that you can't get negotiations. Um, and we do at least now have a kind of pause between now and March, <clears throat> when the level of warfare may drop for quite different reasons. Uh, there will still be missiles, there will still be offensives, but at a lower level. It may be that Russia will do that because it wants to regroup its forces. Whether it can is another matter. But there is, if you like, a pause brought on in part by the weather. And that, I think, is one thing which, in a curious way, might allow some time for even sort of measured thought. But I have to say, I wouldn't put too much hope in it in the moment. And maybe others of us here present tonight, I'm sure we've got a lot of expertise here, can give their own views. Um, but so compared with a month ago, things look less hopeful. But the key thing is you have to be available. The specialists and the informal people have to be there to at least try. If they're not, then there isn't any real chance of progress whatsoever. So to that extent, I think it's all power to people who are engaged in this kind of work, but I don't think we should pretend at all that it's going to be easy to make the progress. If we see any kind of progress between now and say the end of February, I think if anybody has the possibility to their channels, whether in Scotland, England, Wales, or wherever, just to remind politicians that if there's any opportunity to even start, then grab it. Because the other side of the coin is a war going on for a long time, always with the risk of a sudden escalation and always in the background the fear of an escalation to weapons of mass destruction. That I think is pretty distant at the moment, but that could change really quite rapidly, which we have to be cautious of.